Well, a warm welcome again to HTVB. You will have seen there that Alpha begins again here on Wednesday, the 20th of September, which is not this Wednesday, but it's the Wednesday after. And Alpha is a great opportunity to explore the meaning of life, to have a safe, fun, friendly place, which often we don't have in the busyness of life, to ask the really important questions. If there is a God, how can you know God? Um, does my life have any purpose or meaning? How can I get guidance? Um, why do bad things happen to good people? What about other faiths? Um, does God heal? These really big first order questions. And it can really transform uh, lives. I've seen it happen again and again and again in the Alpha Small Groups. And what always happens is great friendships are made and a lot of fun is had. So I'd encourage you, if you've never done Alpha before, to come along. But also, if you've got friends or uh, work colleagues or family members that you think would love the opportunity to give it a go, then just invite them along. We always say, come once. If you like it, come back. If you don't, don't. We start serving food in here every Wednesday at uh, 7 p.m. and then we start properly at 8. We always finish by 9.30. And this round, for the first time ever, you can do it um, either in English or in Mandarin. We'll have the uh, English groups in here. The Mandarin groups will be in the cafe. So you can invite anyone. Give it a go. Today, my talk, my sermon, is entitled, The Grace Effect, right at the heart of the Christian faith is grace. It's unique. Grace means the unmerited, unwarranted love and favor of God for you and for me. And it's not cheap. Sure, there's nothing that we do to receive it, but it cost Jesus everything, dying in our place on the cross. And grace doesn't mean that we're now free to do whatever we like, because God's love and grace inspires us. It challenges us to live big lives of purpose and of love and of grace to others. And our reading today is from the book of Jonah. Jonah, whose name means dove, which I think is quite a cool name to give somebody. Um, Jonah was a prophet around 750 BC. And the entire book of Jonah is really about grace. And the book shines a spotlight on grace by contrasting God's amazing grace with Jonah's lack of grace for others. This is why still to this day, every year, uh, Jews read out the entire book of Jonah at Yom Kippur, the Day of Atonement, when they remember that only God can save us from our sins. So what does this book tell us about grace? Well, we're going to have a look at the whole story we're going to look at chunks of it, but we're going to begin at chapter 1, verse 1. It should come up on the screen. The word of the Lord came to Jonah, son of Amittai. Go to the great city of Nineveh and preach against it, because its wickedness has come up before me. Now, Nineveh was the capital city of Assyria. And Assyria was the emerging superpower of the region north of Israel. But Jonah ran away from the Lord and headed for Tarshish. Tarshish uh, was in the south of Spain. He went down to Joppa where he found a ship bound for that port. After paying the fare, he went aboard and sailed for Tarshish to flee from the Lord. Now, what happens in the rest of chapter one is God sends a storm. The sailors think the boat's 
going to uh, go down in the sea. They say, why is this happening? And Jonah comes clean. He says, it's because I'm fleeing from God. The sailors try and save the ship, but in vain. And they say, what can we do? And Jonah says, there's only one way to save it. Throw me overboard. And if you do that, the storm will pass. And they say, we don't really want to do that. And they say, he says, it's the only way. So they take Jonah and they throw him overboard. And as soon as they do, the sea becomes calm. Jonah sinks down into the depths. It looks like it's the end of him. But God sends a big fish to swallow him. That's chapter one. You can summarize that by calling it sea action. There's lots of sea action going on, right? Then chapter two. We're not going to read it, but the whole of chapter two is in the fish's belly, right? Jonah's inside this fish, and he begins to pray. He, his prayer is basically acknowledging that God has saved him. And he finishes this long prayer with the words, salvation comes from the Lord. And then, at God's command, the fish vomits Jonah out onto dry land. And so if chapter one is sea action, chapter two is knee action. Okay, it's cheesy, but go with it, right? Okay. (laughs) Chapter three, God says to Jonah, look, there's no point running away. Go to Nineveh. Okay. So he goes to Nineveh, and he prophesies this in this city. So this is uh, Jonah chapter 3, looking at verse 4. Jonah began by going a day's journey into the city, proclaiming 40 more days and Nineveh will be overthrown. Actually, the word there literally means overturned. The Ninevites believed. A fast was proclaimed and all of them, from the greatest to the least, put on sackcloth. In fact, uh, not only do they listen to what Jonah has to say, the king of Assyria says, every man, woman, and child, it's a fast, you've got to pray, you've got to repent, and God, who is compassionate, might relent. Amazing, really. And God does. It says this, when God saw what they did and how they turned from their evil ways, he had compassion and did not bring upon them the destruction he had threatened. So chapter one, see action. Chapter two, knee action. Chapter three, the Ninevites, reaction. Go with it. Chapter four, Jonah is not pleased. He's angry that God's relented, and he basically has a big pity party by himself. So this is Jonah's me action. That's all I could think of that would rhyme, but... And he complains. So we're going to read chapter 4 right now. But but to Jonah, this seemed very wrong. And he became angry. He prayed to the Lord, isn't this what I said, Lord, when I was still at home? that, that, That is what I tried to forestall by fleeing to Tarshish. I knew that you are a gracious and compassionate God, slow to anger and abounding in love, a God who relents from sending calamity. So basically, he's complaining that God is too gracious and compassionate. Now, Lord, take away my life, for it is better for me to die than to live. But the Lord replied, is it right for you to be angry? Jonah had gone out and sat down at a place east of the city. There he made himself a shelter, sat in its shade, and waited to see what would happen to the city. Then the Lord God provided a leafy plant and made it grow up over Jonah to give him shade for his head to ease his discomfort. And Jonah was very happy about the plant. It was probably a a castor oil shrub. They grow uh, very quickly to about 12 feet high with big leaves. But at dawn the next day, God provided a worm which chewed the plant so that it withered. When the sun rose, God provided a scorching east wind, and the sun blazed on Jonah's head so that he grew faint. He wanted to die and said, it would would be better for me to die than to live. But God said to Jonah, is it right for you to be angry about the plant? It is, he said, and I'm so angry, I wish I were dead. That is angry, right? 
But the Lord said, you have been concerned about this plant, though you did not tend it or make it grow. It sprang up overnight and died overnight. And should I not have concern for the great city of Nineveh, in which there are more than 120,000 people who cannot tell their right hand from their left, and also many animals? And then the book finishes there with that question on a cliffhanger. It's an extraordinary story. Do you know, in this world, we'll see lots of problems, we'll see evil, things will come against us. The question is, how will we react? Jonah, the book, has this wonderful symmetry in it. The midpoint, the climax really, is uh, his prayer in the fish. Salvation comes from the Lord. And then this symmetry either side of that. So at the start of the book, God is looking down on the city of Nineveh at its wickedness. At the end in chapter four, Jonah is sitting on a hill east of the city looking down upon Nineveh. But God and Jonah react in completely opposite ways. God's reaction is one of righteous anger. Jonah's is self-righteous anger. God's righteous anger leads to compassion and rescue. Jonah's self-righteous anger leads to condemnation and a desire for revenge. Completely the opposite. So what does this story tell us about grace and the effect it can have on your life and mine? Well, the first thing is this. Grace helps us get our priorities right in life. You see, if you have a right perspective and you see things correctly, you can order them correctly. So from a place of grace, we then see the world as God does, and we can see his priorities for our lives. But Jonah doesn't accept the grace that God has for the Ninevites, so he gets his priorities completely wrong. They're all back to front. But the problem is, if we get our priorities the wrong way around, disastrous things happen. I saw, I saw this photograph. Shouldn't have worn that baseball cap the wrong way around. He'd got his hat and his priorities back to front. This is what happens to Jonah. He's sitting on the hill, looking down at the city of Nineveh, angry that God's relented and not destroyed it. He'd rather that the city be destroyed and his reputation protected than his reputation destroyed and the city protected. And what's more, when the worm eats the plant that was providing him shade, he completely overreacts. And he has this go at God uh, in in, uh, uh, verse 9 of chapter 4. God says to him, Do you have a right to be angry about the vine? And what does Jonah say? I do, he said. I am angry enough to die. It's a plant. Maybe you like your plant at home and you water and care for it, but if it withered, you probably wouldn't be angry enough to die. The Lord says, you've been concerned about this vine, though you did not tend it or make it grow. But Nineveh has more than 120,000 people in it who can't tell their right hand from their left and many cattle. Should I not be concerned for them? In other words, Jonah, like some sort of extremist vegetarian, cares more for the plant than he does for the people of Nineveh. His priorities are wrong. But grace enables us to align our priorities with God's plan for our life. I wonder, what are your priorities in life? What do you really value the most? Generally speaking, I think God's priorities, the big blocks for all of us, for our lives would be this. Number one, our relationship with God. That's 
the most important thing, because everything else flows from that, our relationship with our Creator. Number two, our family. Our spouse, our relationship with the one we're married, if we are married, or uh, our children, or our parents, the relationship with our parents, our siblings, how we relate to our cousins, the family comes next. Number three, our work life. Whatever you do, whether it's paid or unpaid, how you spend your day, how you work. Because our family and our work life, that's our greatest mission. That's our ministry. Most, they're the number one and number two most important ministries we'll ever have. And then number four, serving in church. That's the order. Relationship with the Lord, our family dynamics, our work life, our church life. They're the big building blocks. But it's easy, isn't it, in life to get our priorities wrong or to, to get them blurred and mixed up. But if we put on, as it were, the glasses of grace, we begin to see life as God sees it. We see other people as God sees them. And we get our perspective and our priorities in order. Secondly, grace can help heal our relationships. None of us can earn a relationship with God. It's a free gift of grace because of what Jesus has done. And this gift is open for you. It's open for every single person on the planet. And it's not based on a merit system. It's not like there's a bell curve of holiness. And if you're in the, uh, the, the top however many percent, then the Lord will love you. And thank goodness it's not on a merit system. Because if it was, we'd all fall short, right? It is unmerited. It is grace. But for some people, sadly, particularly those that may see themselves a little bit further along than most of us on the bell curve of holiness, uh, grace can seem unfair. So in chapter four, Jonah is not only physically looking down from the hill to the city of Nineveh, he's spiritually and morally looking down on them. You see, Assyria were the enemy, threatening Israel's northern border. They were Gentiles. They were wicked. Whereas Jonah... Well, he was a prophet of the chosen people of God. He looked down on them. But once we understand and we grasp grace, we only ever look down on somebody if we're helping them up. And of course, the irony is, and I love this about this book, Jonah is the only thing in the entire book who doesn't obey God. Think about it. The sea obeys God. The sailors obey God. The fish obeys. The Ninevites obey. The east wind and the sun obeys. The plant obeys. Even the worm obeys. But Jonah does not. We're never quite so far along on the bell curve of holiness as we think we are. And to Jonah, this offensive nature of grace makes him angry and breaks relationship, not just with the Ninevites, but with God. He's angry with God, and it damages the relationship. Verse 4 says, Jonah was greatly displeased and became angry. He prayed to the Lord, O Lord, is this not what I said when I was still at home? That is why I was so quick to flee to Tarshish. I knew that you are a gracious and compassionate God, slow to anger and abounding in love. Now, we don't know whether Jonah gets over his anger at God. I assume he does because he probably then wrote the book. But twice God asked Jonah this remarkable question. He says, Do you have any right to be angry? 
I wonder if anything's making you angry in your life at this moment in time. Let's ask ourselves again today that question. Do we have the right to be angry? As Kate Molest once put it brilliantly, she said, Jonah was a moaner because grace isn't fair. It isn't. That's the whole point. God's love is unmerited. And that is really good news for you and for me and eventually, actually, for Jonah as well. Grace can help not distort but heal our relationships with others and, most importantly, with God. It's one reason why every run of Alpha, I love to sit in the small group because every time I see this happen. Just on the last run of Alpha, this young woman was in my group. She was not a Christian. Then she heard about the grace of God and she opened up her heart and um, decided to allow God in and she chose to follow Jesus. And then a couple of weeks after that, she confessed to the whole group that um, her relationship with her mother was not good. In fact, they hadn't spoken or seen each other for two years. But suddenly, she had this new compassion, desire to reach out to her mum. So she said, would we pray? So we prayed for her, and that evening she wrote an email. Amazingly, the mum responded straight away. They arranged to meet up for lunch. And we prayed again as a group for her, and then they met up, and her relationship with her mum was completely restored. Do you know, only Jesus, only the grace of God can heal in that way. God's grace helps us get our priorities right. It helps heal our relationships. Thirdly, it enables us to love even when it costs us. When God chooses uh, someone, sometimes the accusation can be, well, isn't God exclusive? But God always chooses someone or some group exclusively so that through them, he can bless others inclusively. That's how it works. Think of Abraham. God called Abraham He chose Abraham, exclusive, but he said, so that through your descendants, I might bless the whole world, inclusive. That's the calling that was on Israel. That's why they were chosen. And Jonah in this book is a sort of personification of Israel at that moment in history. Because like him, they'd become disobedient and they didn't want others to be blessed. Why? Because it was going to cost them. Let me explain. When in chapter 3, Jonah gets to the city of Nineveh, he walks around the city and he says just one thing. He just keeps on saying, 40 days and Nineveh will be overturned. Now this word overturned has a double meaning. One meaning is judgment. And that's why when Jesus walked into the temple and he saw all of the, co- the conmen and the money changers sitting down, ripping people off, he went up to them and overturned the tables in the temple as a sign of judgment. But there's a second meaning. In Deuteronomy 23, verse 5, the same word is used. It says God will overturn curse into a blessing. You see, either way, Jonah's prophecy would be fulfilled. Either the Ninevites would not repent and they'd be overturned, judged, wiped out. Or they would repent and the curse would be overturned into blessing. And this is where the cost came in for Jonah and Israel. This is why he runs. You see, Jonah was a contemporary of two other prophets, Amos and Hosea. And he would have known their prophecies. In particular, Amos's prophecy that because of their disobedience, 
Israel would be punished by a people from the north, Assyria. So Jonah knows, okay, if I run away, if I don't warn the Assyrians, then they can't repent. If they don't repent, they'll be destroyed. If they're destroyed, they can't attack and harm us. You see the logic. Jonah had a choice. It's us or them. But God always calls us to love the them. He always calls us to prefer over ourselves the them. When Jesus was being nailed to the cross, what did he pray? Father, forgive them, for they don't know what they're doing. And of course, they could only be forgiven precisely because of what he was doing. Jesus had a choice, save himself or save us. We were the Assyrians at the cross, and Jesus chose you and me. I wonder in your life, who is the them? Will you love them, even if it costs? Fourthly and finally, grace also helps you and me Step into your God-given purposes and plan for your life. What I find most encouraging about the book of Jonah is that in spite of Jonah's failures, God still uses him. He even uses his failures. Just as God will use you and me. You see, you might have a plan for your life. It might be a good plan, but God's plan for your life is the best plan. You can't better that. And it's a perfect plan. And his purposes for our lives are always greater than our weakness. You see, Jonah was a prophet. That's what he did. And he was used to prophesy. He was good at it. But God's purposes, yes, he uses our strengths, but he takes us through beyond our strengths to our place of weakness, and he uses that as well. So Jonah. Jonah is also mentioned elsewhere in the Old Testament. 2 Kings chapter 14. He had prophesied about the reestablishment of the northern border of Israel. You see, Israel had lost some of its northern territory to the king of Damascus. And Jonah famously prophesied that Israel would get it back, it would be restored. And this had actually come true during the reign of King Jeroboam II. So Jonah's ministry thus far has been defined by the pushing back, the forcing back of the foreigner. If he has a weakness, if we're honest, he's a little bit xenophobic. But God uses that, ironically. He then sends Jonah precisely to the northern foreigner to warn them, to save them, to serve them. God takes us through our strengths to our weaknesses. And don't be surprised if God uses your weaknesses to do amazing things, even more than he uses your strengths. I'll share with you a silly example from my life. Um, Years ago, uh, I was living in a part of England at a church there, and every year, it was an amazing church, they'd send a big team from the congregation uh, to another city or town in the country to help the local churches there with an evangelistic mission, a one-week mission. And uh, we went to this one town in the northwest where church attendance is very low, and um, there were lots of teams. It was really well organized by the local churches there. They had us go in and do um, 
guest services on a Sunday, a big evangelistic event one evening uh, in the town hall. We sent teams into the local schools, and um, I was assigned in, to the open air um, preaching team. I thought, oh great, we're gonna do some outdoor evangelism. And I thought, I hope I can speak. And they said, no, yeah, we've got other people who are better at that. You're on the juggling team. I went, what? They said, what we want you to do is you're part of a small team, you're gonna juggle in the town square every day, draw a crowd, and then we're gonna send in the preachers to share the gospel. Now, I should have told them, but I was a bit embarrassed, but I can't juggle. But it was okay, because I was paired up with John, and John was an amazing juggler. And his routine climaxed with him on a unicycle, right? He's so, that's meant to be me on a unicycle, okay? So, how was that? Yeah, something like that. So he's on a unicycle, right? And then he would juggle a bowling ball, a raw egg, and a chainsaw. No joke. And I sort of arranged it with John that my one job would be to stand at the side, say, yeah, go for it, John, and then hand him the bowling ball, the raw egg, and then (laughs) give him the chainsaw. I thought, I can do that. Okay, so it gets to the first day. We're all there, ready to do in the town hall, uh, in the town square, ready to do it, but John's not there. I'm thinking, where is John? Where is John? We get the phone call. He's in bed with a fever, literally shaking like a leaf. He can't juggle. And the team goes, oh, it's okay. Miles, over to you. (laughs) At this point, I have to come clean and say, I can't juggle. And they said, what, you can't juggle a chainsaw and a bowling ball? Like it's the most normal thing in the world. I'm like, no. Can you unicycle? No. And they say, well, how about these? I said, well, not really. But they put these in my hand and they push me into the middle of the town square. I think, oh, no. Uh, So I start trying to juggle, right? And then I think, no, no, please, honestly, don't get excited. There is no chainsaw around there, I promise. (laughs) So I'm juggling and I think, okay, I better try and do some tricks. And then I try and do another one. Okay, and... And that's just it. Every time I drop the ball, the the crowd starts to clap. They start to get more excited. The crowd gets bigger because they're thinking, ah, this guy's very clever. He's pretending he can't juggle. (laughs) So that when his act gets really dangerous, there'll be lots of drama and suspense, and then he'll be amazing. And they thought this because, unfortunately, behind me, they could see the bowling ball, the egg, and the chainsaw. So I'm getting worse and worse. They're getting more and more excited, at which point I run and say to the preachers, on you go. So they go on, poor things, and they start sharing the gospel, and everybody goes, what, is that that the end of the juggling? It was rubbish. And they start walking off. But thankfully, this one guy had just come along. He'd not seen the act, he'd just seen the crowd, he'd come in at the end, and he he actually listened to them share about the good news of Jesus. And then they say, does anybody here want to put their faith in Christ? He puts his hand up. He's the only one. So we pray for him, and uh, he chooses to invite Jesus into his life and to start to follow him. And then after we prayed for him, I said to him, oh, what do you do? And he said this, I'm a professional juggler. (laughs) You're joking me. And then I got worried. I said, you didn't see my act, did you? He said, no, no. I said, well, you know, it's just the old unicycle chainsaw act. (laughs) Um, But I said to him, what are you doing this time tomorrow? He goes, well, I only work in the evening, so I'm free. I said, great, come here. And then he did the routine the rest of the week, which was amazing. Now, the point is this. I am not a good juggler. But somehow, God used me being rubbish 
to speak to this guy who then could use his strengths in that mission. God is going to use your weaknesses, just as he did with Jonah, sending him to the very people that he saw as the enemy to do an amazing work. When God calls us, it's always greater than our weaknesses, and it's stronger than our reluctance. Maybe there's something that you're reluctant to do, but deep down, you know that God is asking you to do it. Maybe this message is to give you that encouragement, that nudge this next week to do it. Or maybe there's that person when you think of who will I invite on this next run of Alpha. There's that person, that colleague or that friend that keeps on coming to mind, but you're reluctant to risk asking them. God's purposes for our lives are always greater than our weaknesses and stronger than our reluctance and larger than our expectations. You see, the true significance of Jonah's ministry, he cannot have known. Because by the time we get to Jesus, in Matthew chapter 12, the crowds are around him. And the cynics, the Pharisees, the teachers of the law say, come on, Jesus, give us a miracle. Give us a sign to prove who you say you are. And Jesus says to them, I'm not going to give you a sign apart from one. The sign of the prophet Jonah. Just as Jonah spent three days and three nights in the belly of the fish, so the Son of Man will spend three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. He was referring to the time between his crucifixion and his glorious resurrection on that first Easter Sunday. The resurrection that means that you and I, when anyone choose to follow him, we too share in that new resurrection, eternal life. Jonah cannot have realized or expected his ministry to be so big. And the same is true for you and for me. I I don't know if you have a plan for your life or you have a secret hope or dream. Whatever God's plan is for you, I know one thing, it's bigger than you're expecting. It's bigger than your plan. It's bigger than my plan. You know, at the start of November, we, we move next door into the new, bigger venue. Maybe you have an expectation, a hope, or a dream, what God might do with us as a community in this new chapter in the life of HTBB. I know that whatever I'm expecting, God's plan is bigger. Jesus said this, there's only one way into the kingdom of God. It's through the narrow gate, meaning him. Well, yes, the gate might be narrow, but it leads to a life wider and more spacious than we could ever expect or imagine. Amen? Would you like to stand, please? We're going to pray now and step afresh into that wide, spacious life in Christ. You might want to either close your eyes or put your hands out as if receiving a gift. And we're going to invite the Spirit of Christ, the Holy Spirit, into our lives, his love to be poured into our hearts and say yes, Lord, to that wide, spacious, expectant life. Just silently pray, come, Holy Spirit, would you fill me again with your presence right now? And just receive. There's no merit system about receiving. All we do is ask, and when we ask, we receive.